in the 1970s, the BBC used to have a Sunday serial every week. And this particular Sunday in 1971, um, they had the first part of something called Sunset Song. I'd never heard of the book. I watched it. I used to wait every week for Sunday to come around. And I ran out and bought it. I bought the book, not realizing that it was a part of a trilogy called A Scots Quair. Um, it's quite difficult to get into because it, it's written in the Doric tongue. But once you get past the first three chapters, you know, you just can't put it down. I mean, the closing chapter, you just read through tears. It's so moving. But I saw it, as I say, on BBC One, Sunday night, 1971. Sunset Song is the story of Chris Gufford, a young Aberdeenshire lass growing up on a farm pre-World War One, And it's a rites of passage story that tells her tale from mid-teens to mid-twenties. And it's essentially an intimate epic. The themes that the film covers, uh, obviously in the run-up to the First World War, the world was changing, technology was coming in, so the way the land was farmed um, completely changed, and that had an impact on uh, Chris and her family. But in the run-up to war also, there were themes of pacifism and socialism, and that impacts on the family and, the, and their friends, and it's, you know, it's, really, uh, it's really engaging uh, material for us when we were reading the book and obviously then turn into the script. I'm not that familiar with the book. I know of the book. It's a Scots classic. Um, but if I'm hand on heart, I think I've read sections of it when I was at school. But I was I was blown away by the intimate epic, as they call it. Um, just beautiful, beautiful piece of writing and a beautiful adaptation. Well, adapting a book or a play is always difficult because you you have to capture its essence whilst making it cinematic. I mean, reading a book is not the same as seeing images run past you at 24 frames per second. It's not. You can go back and you can read chapters that you're not quite sure of. In a film, you've just got the moment. Um, so you have to capture the essence of the book and sometimes change it for dramatic purposes. But it has to be cinematic. It has to be cinematically told. And images work in a way that reading prose does not. They work in a subtextual way, and very often it's an emotional connection between the cuts that actually make the story. So inevitably some people who love the book will say it's not very good and I hope that people will like it because I, I, I revere the book and I want to do um, Lewis Grussick give him justice because he died at the age of 34 virtually unrecognised out of Scotland and that is tragic. He's got, he's got to be read by everybody. What's really, really lovely about this job is that everybody you talk to in the industry or around, um, you know, the first thing they say is, oh my God, what an amazing, amazing piece of text, amazing piece of literature. And, and you know, I, kn I knew the piece really, really well. I'd studied it before. It's, it's folkloric up here. It's historic. It's really, really well known, certainly in these parts, but all over Scotland. And uh, it's a real untold story, you know, in terms of filmic value or theatrical value. I read it few years back and just loved it. Went right up to the top of my list of favourite books. So when I got the edition through that I was going to do Sunset Song, I couldn't, I couldn't believe my luck. So I was really pleased and, and then just ecstatic that I got the part, you know. So yeah, I absolutely loved the book. It's beautiful. And filming it out here in, in Aberdeenshire, previously having been in New Zealand, then Luxembourg, and now finally coming home to where it's set is just incredible. One thing that was so amazing that I'm so glad that it worked out this way is that we shot all the um, outdoor stuff in New Zealand first. It helped me with this journey for her from going from obviously the sun and the light and the star and how magic she is and how, you know, we were immersed into the land, which was what she, what she is. She represents that. So to film that first literally injected me 
with like this gift of of carry this with you the whole of the shoot so for the rest of the shoot I had I had like the heart of her with me the whole time well when I do auditions it's always been on the basis of the person who does the best audition gets the role um, and I because I don't know a lot about modern popular culture I didn't know Agnes Stain was a model I just didn't she came in and she did the audition and I thought we found her I said to Saul we found her I just knew I was like I have to go in here and give it my all obviously everything that you do you want to go and do it but it was just this different thing for this project and I chose the scene where Ewan comes home and they have this argument in the kitchen and she grabs the knife and she's like you know I'll not be treated like a Lanark tar you know that like I just had this real connection to the fight in her and I don't know I just love I loved that part of Chris Terence is, uh, is absolutely unique. Um, he's unlike any director I've ever worked with. Um, he's, you know, a film icon in our industry, and, and, and therefore I was quite in awe of him uh, leading up to working with him. I, w I was nervous, I was scared, I was excited. Um, but when I met him, you know, he's, we call him Uncle Des, you know, he's just such a, a lovely, lovely man, and he just makes you feel so relaxed. And he's got a real sort of a really, really special way of directing you. He might use an anecdote, he might use, uh, from his experience, you know, maybe a family story, or uh, he'll, he'll talk from an excerpt of prose or poetry. Um, and he does a lovely thing where, you know, when we were back in the studios over in Luxembourg, he did a lot of, uh, that's the one, that's the one, cut, we use that one and move on. And so he, he sort of ushers everybody into that kind of, uh, that energy. Um, so you can't help but getting taken away by that. You can ask any any actor on this set, and they'll all tell you the same thing. It's a, 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 a genuine, genuine honour, privilege, and most importantly, a joy to work with him because he's has a lovely manner about him, creates a lovely atmosphere amongst the actors on set. You feel free, you feel protected, all the usual stuff that you ask of a director, and, and he empowers you, allows you to, to bring your interpretation to it. And he's obviously he's Terence Davis. He's he's got a great eye. He's 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 what I would call a kind of a, a lyrical filmmaker. It's not necessarily massively narratively um, motivated. It's it's more poetic. Sometimes when we do a scene and I literally didn't know what had just occurred, and that he'd only just said one word to me, and he knew like exactly how to how to mold me into Chris which which was amazing because I was just held by by this person by Terence the whole way through and he he you know knew how to get those little moments and and make me understand you know where she was coming from and where she was going and you know that's you know you can't ask for anything anything better than that. Well, I always say the same, D don't act, feel it. If it's felt, it's true. If it's acted, it's false. Um, and uh, an awful lot of acting goes on in films, particularly British films, and you think, oh dear, they're gonna start acting now. And it's always so depressing, because it's never believable. Um, but they're not doing that. They, I say, if I say do this, and it doesn't feel right, don't do it. If you feel it, something happens. What And the magic of film is it captures the fleeting moment. And I love the magic of that, of someone doing something with a line that you'd never thought of. That I just find absolutely, I just find it thrilling. Peter Mullen, for instance, has given, brought far more warmth to the father than I had imagined, which actually makes the time when he's cruel even worse. But he brought that to it, not me. It was a really difficult shoot in, in some ways, but what, what drove us along with it was the commitment of the of the crew and, and the cast and there was a great there was a great spirit among the cast and crew, you know, uh, all working really hard for Terence. Our heads of department did fantastic work all the way from, you know, Michael D O P 
and key to the film was the design Andy Harris's designer who was absolutely fantastic his eye for detail and his eye and his attention to accuracy was just incredible and it was great to work with him and the job he did along with the team in Luxembourg was absolutely uh, stunning and makeup you know um, aging Agnes through um, over 20 years was really important and uh, Katja Reinhardt the um, head of makeup did an incredible job um, lots of wigs lots of makeup so it was a challenge as it was for all HLDs but again you know everybody rose to, to rose to that challenge we showed him just a couple of fabrics and I've showed him my book with all the references and then I did my my own thing and uh, Terence was always very trustable and he gave me just little advices and he let me do my my, um, my way and that was very comfortable for me I must say and it was a very very nice experience to work in that way because it's not always like that a lot of times you have a lot of other people getting involved and on this one I must say they leave me do my job and I'm very proud of the uh, result of everything. Logistics is definitely a big part of my job as well as obviously finding and uh, setting up nice locations but we, we had to make them work so getting all the uh, necessary equipment and, and uh, trucks and people to the set is very much sort of part and parcel of the job. The weather is the biggest worry we've had um, trying to uh, particularly when we were filming the standing stone scenes up the up the hill, the sort of uh, the threat of wind was particularly a worry, but we managed to nail that in some very lovely weather actually, and uh, we've been generally very lucky. I've learned, I don't know this. Michael has taught me to be freer, and that really is a gift. It's really a gift, and I trust him absolutely. He knows the lenses I use, he studied my work, so he knows what the framing is. All I have to do is tweak it, because um, he's an intuitive, he's cinematically intuitive. Um, and I'm blessed with someone like Susanna Lenton, who's the script supervisor. Um, who's a wonderful script supervisor, but on Deep Blue Sea, which was the first time we worked together, um, I couldn't find a frame, and that very rarely happens. And I just thought, I can't find a frame. And I really was worried, and was sitting there thinking, what do I do, like 20 minutes goes by, and you think, God. And she just said, is the action true? As soon as she said it, I thought, you're right, change the action. I'll ne I've never forgotten that. It's a wonderful piece of advice. Um, so you learn all the time, you learn from other people, and that's the joy. That's the joy. If you don't learn from other people, then you never develop. And it's lovely to see people gradually developing um, over the course of two days, even. Um, I just find it thrilling watching. I don't get out a lot. That's the problem. <laughs>